Welcome to the Office Hours Podcast. This is TK Coleman and Isaac Morehouse. We're like the geek squad for your professional development. Got a job you're trying to get, a work-related issue you're trying to resolve, a project you're trying to complete, an obstacle that's holding you up? Well, you're in the right place. You bring the problem, we bring the nuts and bolts. This is where you get philosophical insight and actionable advice on how to take charge of your life and career. You sent me an article last night. I did. C.S. Lewis, The Inner Ring. It, it, it's, that kind of stuff reminded me of why it's so important to read books and read the classic works that have stood the test of time. I know I might sound like an elitist here, uh, but after just reading a bunch of blogs, that stuff was like 10 times better than 90% of the stuff I've read all year. Such well, amazing I mean, stuff. And you don't have to be, you don't have to be an elitist or make a judgment about claiming that, you know, blog posts are of bad quality. In fact, you could firmly believe that blog posts are on average five to 10 times better than old books, mm. but you still would say we have had blogs for a decade, a couple decades max, mm. and we've had books for a couple thousand years. And so even if the average individual post is better, which I, I don't think it, it is in most cases, but, or they're the same, there's the sheer volume of stuff that's trapped in the world of print and has never made it onto the internet behooves you to go exploring beyond, you know, the pages of the web. Word up, man. I got to agree. Hey, so this inner ring, what, what made you share that with me? Was that you, you said this was like an old favorite of yours. I guess you come back and read this every once in a while. <laughs> well, yeah. So I've come across it a handful of times, but it had been a long time and I had actually forgotten about it, but I was on Twitter and I saw uh, Robin Hansen, who is a really interesting thinker, economist, um, just kind of dabbles in everything. He just tweeted it. Um, which I thought was really interesting because because C.S. Lewis is most commonly heralded by religious people and Robin Hanson, to my knowledge, is not. But he just said, oh, great, great article about the, the dangers of prestige um, and uh, or a great sermon by C.S. Lewis. And I went and I was like, oh, my gosh, I remember this one. I had forgotten all about this. Um, and it's a really powerful little thing, the, the inner ring. Um, and Lewis is basically making the claim that one of the strongest human desires and one that is rarely openly acknowledged the way that say desire for, you know, alcohol or partying or sex or other things are openly acknowledged is the desire to be on the inside on this elusive, hard to define thing. That's like Mm. the inside track, the cool click, you know, whatever the inner circle is, there's always one more further inner circle and the desire to be in it. And the thing that I love the most about it was that he makes the distinction between the thing itself being bad and the desire for it. So he says, there's nothing bad about inner circles. In fact, they're inevitable. Um, there's nothing, you, you're unavoidable. They're, you just are going to have some people who have a closer bond than others or who, who are more in the know or trade secrets or whatever. The desire to be in the inner circle for no other reason than to be in it, that's what's dangerous, right? So rather than like, I want to you know, grow as a person and this, this demands that I get to know certain people who have certain knowledge and by sort of an accident, a, a sort of inner circle dynamic forms, well, there's nothing necessarily bad about that. But seeing an inner circle and having this overwhelming desire to be a part of it just so you can feel like you have some sort of meaning or you're not on the outside, that's incredibly dangerous and destructive. And it's you know, the root of envy, um, I've seen a lot of good stuff. Paul Graham has an essay on seeking prestige and the dangers there. I've written quite a bit about prestige um, and the, 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 the damage of seeking prestige, sort of making sure you rank in the arbitrary social hierarchy instead of pursuing the things that have meaning to you. So I just thought it was a really good essay. You know, one, one interesting insight that, that he talked about in there was uh, the importance of not equating prestigious groups with inner rings. They certainly take that form. Um, some inner rings are defined by prestige, but there are also non-glamorous inner rings. So, you know, many people fall prey to the trap of inner rings that are defined by a self-righteous contempt for prestige. And, and, and you, can fall, you can fall for the trap in the same way. To the the too cool for school ring or whatever, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm different for the sake of being different. Or I hate pop culture just because too many people like it. And, and that comes off just as fake just as inauthentic as anything else and more important than how it comes off. It just, 
to use Lewis's language here, it makes a scoundrel of you, you know? I love hey, it. So what, what, what's the solution? What do you do? Yes, you can fall prey to an inner ring, but, but what's the thing that you do? I mean, for me, I have like this strong aversion, partially natural, partially cultivated to anything that smacks of collectivism, patriotism, yeah. school spirit, you know, yeah. uh, being part of a movement, being a figurehead to other people, having a, like, now we have a very tight team in Praxis and I'm very partial to in, in Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One, the idea that like all culture starts from, you know, the word cult and a startup is a cult in a way. And all that is true. There is like a tight bond and we're in the trenches together. But the minute that becomes a goal, like let's have an inside group. Let's all like have this, this bond that that's when it gets really insidious. And that is just sort of a byproduct. It happens. And if, and if there's ever a feeling that like the entire value of being a part of something derives from the mere fact that you are a part of it, that's a dangerous place to be in. I never want to be in that place. You know, I don't want to follow a thinker or read a book simply because I want to be a part of the group people who follow this thinker or people who read this book. That's really dangerous. And likewise, I don't want people to follow me simply because they want to be a part of some group or some movement. Um, so I think constantly redefining your own goals and desires and interests and making sure what you're pursuing is because it helps you achieve something that you want to achieve regardless of what status it holds in anybody else's mind. Dare to be an individual. There's a quote from that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, then we can move on, uh, where, he, where he says, if you want to be made free of a certain circle, for some wholesome reason. If say you want to join a musical society because you really like music, then there's a possibility of satisfaction. You may find yourself playing in a quartet and you may enjoy it. But if all you want is to be in the know, your pleasure will be short lived. The circle cannot have from within the charm it had from outside. By the very act of admitting you, it has lost its magic. Once Ooh. the first, like, you know, that, that, I'm gonna stop there. Yeah, 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 yeah. That I got, reminds me of the I old, uh, I think it's, is it Mencken or maybe Mark Twain? I don't remember who it is, but who says, uh, I, would I would never join any club that would accept me as a member. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have a friend at church who would say, there's no such thing as a perfect church. And if there was, they'd stop being that as soon as they let you in. Yep. yep. <laughs> All right. All right so the questions, I'm going to read the one that we previewed last week and you can start, uh, take a stab at it first. Let's do it. All right. So this was the preview from last week. I have lots of stuff to say about how to make improvements in our workplace. And I work at a job where we have regular meetings where employees are encouraged to share this kind of feedback. But there's one problem. I'm not an aggressive personality type and I don't like to argue. And I feel like my opinions quickly get dismissed because of minor objections that I'm not aggressive enough to respond to. This is mostly because other people are louder than me. What can I do? All right, look, I'm gonna give you three things. Number one, you gotta know your audience. Whenever you're giving a message, offering feedback, or making any kind of statement, there are people present who are a part of your audience. They are the people you want to reach. And there are people present who are not part of your audience. And sometimes the loudest, most difficult people to deal with are the people that you aren't even interested in reaching anyway. But those people have an alluring ability to drag you into distracting sideshow discussions that have nothing to do with you moving your agenda forward. We joke about this a lot on Facebook, how you can, you can make a statement and you know who you're speaking to. You know who you want to influence with that resource you're sharing. But who's the loudest person? It's always the person that never would be a potential customer. It's always the person that just doesn't share anything in common with your passions or your philosophy or your product. And as I heard one writer say, you have to be able to detect when you are getting yourself into a pissing match. So if you're in a meeting and you're throwing out ideas and other people are being loud and aggressive and dismissing your ideas, ask yourself, are these people even in my audience? If you're in a meeting with Janet and Steve and Janet says, let's hear what you got. And Steve is quick to dismiss. Don't even pay attention to Steve. Don't even talk to him. Just look right at Janet and say, so Janet, what do you think? That's the first thing. Number two, people that are disagreeable and aggressive can be very easy to deal with once you tap into the power of questions. So let's say you have an idea, you put it out there, 
somebody jumps all over it and you feel like, oh, I can't go toe to toe to this person. I, you know, with this person, I can't make any objections. I can't be as loud as them. Step back and do to them what you would love for them to do to you. In the words of St. Augustine, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Say, okay, you say my idea is crappy. Why, why, why do you think that? Why do you say that? And then give yourself the opportunity to learn something, listen to what they say. And even if it's bad, instead of objecting, just say, all right, I hear what you're saying. What would you say to somebody who says this? Or how would you address this objection? Just take everything that you already believe, put it to them in the form of a question. Since everybody already loves to talk about themselves and their ideas, and they love to defend it against objections, they will go on and on, and you will have used the power of questions to make sure that your idea was on the table for a substantial amount of time and that it got a lot of discussion. Here's the last thing I'm going to leave you with. Don't give yourself an out. Don't automatically assume that just because someone jumps over your idea or disagrees with it in a way that might strike you as rude, that your idea is really good and the only reason it's being rejected is because people just don't want to understand. Because here's one thing I've learned about people, and that's this. No matter how mean people are, no matter how selfish people people are, at the end of the day, if an idea can make their lives better, they don't hate you enough to dismiss that idea. So if you have an idea and you can show people that this idea will benefit them, their hatred for you aside, they will latch on to the idea. So when people dismiss you and reject what you have to say, take it as a personal challenge to improve your ability to sell your ideas in a way that makes people want to listen. <laughs> What's you laughing at? I'm so glad we do this show together. That's so much better than the answer I was going to give. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 see, I probably gave like the nice passive answer. You got an aggressive one coming. No, me- no, I was, <laughs> the first thing I was going to say was, <laughs> oh, just learn to shout more. Get more argumentative. <laughs> I grew up in a household where we interrupt each other all the time. Or, and it's like, there, it's this known thing that taking a side or passionately debating something is not the same as actually believing that thing to be true. Mm. It's like when you are exploring something, you just passionately defend it against all objections. You take, you kind of, you dive in, you interrupt. There's this big, like lively thing going on. And then after you've done that, you step back and decide whether or not you actually believe it or whether it's good. That's part of the exploratory process. And I always feel, and I'm still like that. I'm sure many of my teammates, TK included, uh, hate it. I have an interrupting problem. I'm not always aware that my audience is not all the same as, you know, sort of my family members I grew up with and whatever. So I I don't think that's actually a good thing unless the other parties are um, down with that and, and able to do that. But I always wish more people were. I love just a good raucous discussion um, as part of the exploration process. But so that, so that would have been my answer, which I think is not nearly as good as TK's. Um, <laughs> but, I will, but I will add one small thing, which I mentioned in a previous episode, which is anytime you can change a we should into an I did or an I will. So if you have a suggestion for something that can be done differently rather than, hey, we should do this, which if you are not a loud, aggressive person who's really persuasive and, and outgoing, it can get shot down. But if you can change it into I did, here's something I did. Let me show you. Or, hey, here's something I'm going to do and we'll see. I'll I'll show you guys the results. Or, hey, check out this report I put together with a lot of time and and whatever. I studied this and this and this and it made me believe this. So, I tested it out. Here's what I found. The power and weight of that is really, really huge compared to like, if you're not naturally a good arguer, um, bring something to the table. Show them, don't tell them whenever possible. I love it, man. All right, number two, TK and Isaac. I've heard both of you speak multiple times and I really admire your respective styles. What are some things I can do to become a better public speaker? Did you make that question up just to flatter us? No, I actually got it from somebody (laughs) on Facebook. (laughs) You were like, you know what? (laughs) Let's put in in some questions that make us look really good. (laughs) TK and Isaac, first, let me just say how attractive, funny, and intelligent you are. (laughs) Second, how can I be more like you? (laughs) I'm going to just start directing the TK. Like, this one is for TK. (laughs) How do I be a cool brother? (laughs) TK, how do you deal with Isaac's arrogance, condescension, (laughs) and stupidity? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. 
All right. Public speaking. We, we, yeah, go ahead. You take this one first because we, I think we have externally maybe very different ways of arriving at our public speaking, you know, um, abilities. But in, in many ways, there's a lot more similarity than maybe can be assumed. So you, you take a stab at it first. What are some things you can do to become a public, uh, better public speaker? Yeah, man. So my, for, for me, first and foremost, speaking is a means to an end. The end is to get a point of cross that you got to say, right? So speaking begins with having something to say. It doesn't begin with an obligation. You don't speak because you have to. You don't speak because you see it as a virtue to be good at speaking. You speak because you've got some kind of message inside of you that if you bottle it up and suppress it, you're just going to explode. You're just going to die. You, you, you won't be happy. And, and, and I think the key to being a good speaker is beginning with that. Um, you, you, you've said this many times, uh, and, and it's the whole idea that if you want to be interesting, be interested. If you want to be engaging, be engaged. You want to be fascinating, be fascinated. Um, I think you can focus on techniques for how to outline a talk, how to get your point across, but in a world filled with so many people who read the same books on public speaking, who take the same Toastmaster workshops, who read the same books with all the stories that speakers are told to use, nothing is more interesting than a speaker who can stand up and tell you a story, use an illustration that's fresh and that uniquely belongs to them because they're not trying to speak they're letting something out of their soul that absolutely has to get out. And you can feel the difference when a person has conviction, when a person has belief about what they're saying. You can feel it when a person has got to say it. Like, like I'm saying what I got to say, not because I took a paycheck. I'm saying what I got to say because I can't not say it. Above all else, stick with your interests and refuse to give a talk on anything that you wouldn't die for, that you don't care about. Because the, the, the day you start doing that, you're just a kid in a debating class who's getting up there BSing in order to fulfill an assignment. And I just don't think you can be interesting in that way. You can get by in school that way, but I just don't think you can captivate an audience in that way. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, one of the very earliest Praxis opening seminars might have been the second class or third class. I was running this workshop on public speaking. And uh, it was kind of focusing on sort of a, a few tips and tricks for the technical stuff to you know, kind of improve the your physical presence and um, all that type of thing. And I got, to, I got done with it. And Jeffrey Tucker, who's a friend of mine, a, a prolific writer over at the Foundation for Economic Education, who's given many talks and lectures. Um, and he's a really engaging speaker. He's in high demand. Afterwards, he goes, wow, that was a great workshop. I feel so guilty because I violate every <laughs> single one of the things that you, <laughs> the recommendations that you made. And I started laughing because it's what TK said is so true. You know, I, I've seen Jeff speak and literally, you know, some of the things are like, hey, find a comfortable spot to stand so that you don't feel like you're awkwardly shifting your weight everywhere and that will make you nervous. And I've seen Jeff like standing on one toe and like leaning over the audience and then like, you know, all, literally all the things that like technically. We, we call it the Michael Jackson where like there's this move, this dance move where Michael Jackson stands on his tippy toes and he's yeah, like, leaning right. forward like he should fall. Yeah. It's so, like all the things you're not supposed to do. Some of the best speakers like do all of them because once you are being you and saying something that just has to come out, like TK said, all that other stuff doesn't matter. That's going to get you 90, 95% of the way to a great talk. Mm. And then the other five to 10% is some of those like rules and tips and tricks. Um, so let me, let me boil it down this way. Two, two things. First is things that improve your speaking, never think of them as like, it's not an additive process. What are some tips and techniques and actions I can do and, and all, you know, that I can add to my repertoire to make me better? It's a, it's a subtractive process, if that's a word. It's like chiseling something away. You have to have a message first inside that hunk of granite. And then the goal is just, can you remove a few things that are preventing that message from coming out? Do you have things that are, that are distracting from the message? You know, are you, uh, you know, pacing around too much or talking too fast or too quietly or moving your hands too much or, you know, like if you're writing, if everything is bold and underlined and, and italicized, those are actually distractions that are making it harder for what's inside, the message inside to be communicated. So mm. see if you can strip away, subtract the things that are sort of preventing 
what's in you from coming out. And if you think of it that way, instead of like, oh, I got to add all these new techniques onto my repertoire. No, no, no. Just remove anything that's distracting. And by distracting, I mean, that's making it harder for you to convey those things. Um, And then second, as TK mentioned, talk about what you know. And I think you can do this in way more areas than people think. So an example that I like to use is if I told you, I want you to get up and give a five, 10 minute talk about accounting. If you're like me and you don't really know anything about accounting and you're not an expert in it, this temptation, this fear comes in, imposter syndrome. Oh my gosh, how can I talk about something? Am I an expert? Am I expert enough? And by the way, you'll wonder this no matter what the topic is. Even if you are like the most knowledgeable person in the world, you'll start to feel like, do I know enough? What if there's a question in the Q&A? I don't want to be a poser. I don't, right? The, the simple solution is don't talk about things unless you know them. Talk about the topic that no one can challenge your expertise on, which is you. I don't mean like in a narcissistic way, but say you're given a challenge to talk about accounting. Instead of getting up and being like, well, the uh, accounting process and like trying to BS it, get up and say, you know what? I'm not a professional accountant. I don't know a lot about it, but I'll tell you one lesson. When I was six years old, I ran a lemonade stand with my friends and I wasn't keeping track of the finances at all. And I was super excited because we made $10 and we split it among the three of us. Uh, But I had spent five of my own dollars (laughs) <laughs> buying lemonade. So we ended up, I ended up personally losing money because I wasn't, I didn't understand accounting. And if I would have understood it, I would have realized that that was a bad venture right now. No one can challenge me on that story and say that I don't know what I'm talking about. Cause I'm speaking from a place of knowledge, right? Whether it's personal knowledge of a personal story, an experience you went through a lesson you have learned in your own life. And that's when people are the most engaged and interested. They want to hear something that's unique to you. And I think there's a lot, people have a lot more to offer um, that's unique to their perspective than they think. And, it, and, and nobody cares that you're not the world's most knowledgeable accountant if you tell them a memorable story from your own experience. So speak from a place of true knowledge, which begins with you and your personal experience. And then think of all other stuff as just removing distractions that are keeping that message from getting to your listener. Hey man, what do you think about practicing? I know you and I are big on, on, on this whole idea that if the risk of the learning process aren't real, the rewards aren't real either. But do you think this applies to public speaking? Do you think it makes a difference between, you know, uh, gathering together six or seven friends and saying, I'm going to stand in front of you and, and practice giving my talk versus doing it for a real audience where there's a huge cost? Or, or well, even I mean, recording a video and sharing it on Facebook or something like that? I think practice is always beneficial when you've got a reason to practice. Like if you're just sort of, I want to practice public speaking just in case, like I think it will be, it could, it could be beneficial if you're really interested and motivated to it, but nothing hones it. Like I know I have to actually give a talk at some point coming up in whenever a week, a month, a day. And that drives your practice in a really great way because it helps you put yourself imaginatively in the game time situation. Um, And whether it's you in front of a mirror or recording yourself, or in front of some friends, like, absolutely. I mean, it's just like practicing basketball. Like, no one would ever claim it's a substitute for the game, and practice without any real-world context of what it feels like in a game is far less valuable than practice where you can you can imagine how this is going to contribute to to game time. So, yeah, I'm a huge believer in preparation um, and practice. You know, I, I make outlines before I give a talk, um, so that I can, you know, remember all the points I want to make and the order I want to make them in. Um, I don't script out the whole talk or memorize it, but there are times where I will take that outline and I will give a talk and I want to see, is it, how long is it? Is it good? Is it rumble rambling? Did I take too long in this point? And then I'll kind of like give myself little notes to remember for when I go in live. Um, and I used to do that a lot more now that I have much more, intimate knowledge of the things I want to say and the way I want to say them. I don't have to do that as much, but, um, but yeah, I'm a big fan of that. All right, man. You got time for one more? Yes, I do. All right. This Read is it. A real, this Read is a real, it. A real one, baby. I feel like my life is getting more difficult because I know so much. That may sound arrogant to you guys. <clears throat> it does. But I honestly don't believe that most people are good at thinking critically. It's as if everyone is afraid of being honest with themselves. So they just BS each other with superficial and fake conversation. I believe it's my calling to connect with people and help them. But how can I be polite and conversational with people when I think they're being kind of stupid? Oh, man. Um, 
Look, I firmly agree that most people aren't good at thinking critically, uh, including the asker of this question. (laughs) (laughs) And I completely agree that people are often afraid or incapable of being honest with themselves, as I think is the asker of this question. Because I hear two different things in here. And I'm going to put it in the language of preferences instead of calling, um, because I want to make, make it clear that I think this is you, the individual, who has to own your choice of what you pursue in life, um, what you love, what you value, um, and not pretend like it was imposed upon you externally. Whether or not that's true, I think you're going to live better if you just own it and take it as your own. So you, the asker of this question, is conveying two different preferences in this post. One, I don't like talking with people that I don't think are smart uh, or, you know, they're not intellectually stimulating to me. Um, If that is true, stop doing it. Who do you want to be a hero for? If you don't like being around people and it drives you nuts to talk with them, don't talk to those people. They're not your audience. Forget them. Focus on the people that you do. Mm. But then I hear a second thing being conveyed. I believe it's my calling to connect with people and help them. And there's no qualification, basically all people and help all connect with and help all people. So now you're telling me your preference is to connect with and help all people. But which one do you want? You say that you really don't like talking with people who are unintelligent uh, from your perspective, but you say that you really want to help and connect with all people. One of those is untrue. And you have to have the self-knowledge to figure out which one. Are you really the type of person that genuinely wants to connect with and help all people regardless of intelligence or ability to articulate themselves? If so, you're going to have to deal with this feeling you have of frustration with people's lack of intelligence. Um, And there must be something else going on there. If the opposite is true, that you really just don't enjoy talking with people who aren't very intelligent, then you're going to have to stop pretending that you want to help all people and connect with all people. And whatever you decide is true of you, Accept it, run with it, and don't feel guilty about it. Man, you put the hammer down, man. You put the hammer down. All right, let me follow up with that. <laughs> let me take the edge off a little bit. <laughs> let, 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 let me sweeten it up a little bit. Put a little <laughs> Let's put a little honey in the vinegar. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for the ladies, man, boys. I'm waiting for it, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is, that is correct. Uh, however, what Avic said is, um, yeah, it is just disgusting. It is just wrong. And let me go ahead and explain why. We need to do the whole the whole show with the bad boys. I can be Dr. Phil. You can be the ladies' man. <laughs> All right, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, Dale Carnegie's How to Win and Friends and Influence People. And I, I think there's so much value in paying attention to um, things people reveal to you about themselves when you try to convince them of your arguments. But what's most interesting to me is that people who pride themselves on being rational spend a whole lot of time bemoaning the irrationality of everyone else. And what surprises me most about that is this. If you are truly rational, nothing is more irrational than refusing to deal with the world as it reveals itself to be. In other words, you know, I hear people say things like, well, I think people ought to just be logical enough to accept an argument when it's presented coherently. I shouldn't have to use a story or I shouldn't have to adjust my tone or I shouldn't have to think about the words I use in order to get them to be open to what I have to say. If they're truly rational, the only thing that should matter is the argument itself. And yeah, that's great if we lived in that universe where that's all people cared about. But since we're being rational here, we need to look at the world as it actually is, not as we desire it to be. And the world as it actually is, is a world in which other factors influence people's thinking besides your arguments about what you think is reasonable. And you're not going to have influence over the way people think and behave unless you develop an understanding of and an appreciation of those elements. It reminds me of the Holly Berry movie Gothica where she is like in an asylum. She like wakes up one day in an asylum and she knows she doesn't belong there. She knows she, you know, um, you know, has gotten there by some kind of fluke paranormal happening. And she's trying to explain herself logically to people. And she's giving them good evidence that she's telling the truth and nobody's believing her. And at some point, the girl gets smart. 
at some point she realizes, no matter how logical my arguments are, people ain't buying them. And then she, cha- she changes her strategy and she starts to work on ways to influence people to do what she needs them to do in a way that isn't limited to arguments. Why? Because she compromises rationality? No, but because she's selfish enough to not be someone who lives her whole life going without what she wants merely because she's content to be angry at irrational people all the time. So listen, questioner, if you really care about connecting with people and you really care about influencing people, get off that high horse. Get off that high horse and learn how to understand people. And if you're not willing to put in that work, don't pretend like you care about them. And and if you don't, don't feel bad about it. Like you don't have to be the type of person that wants to connect with everyone in the world. Maybe you you don't want to waste your time talking to most people. I think that's okay. That doesn't have to be a bad thing or a rude thing. And what a liberating thing that is too, man. I find that philosophical FOMO is one of the greatest problems of our time. <laughs> like, the, the, like people are- The idea are, like, well, well, I know this person's an idiot and they won't listen to reason and they're really crazy and they're just lobbing insults. But if I don't engage them, what if I miss out on an opportunity to have a discussion <laughs> that could be valuable? If I only stick with it for five more hours and use the perfect <laughs> analogy, I might convert them to my view. Man, move on. <laughs> oh, love it. Uh, right. What do we got next week? We have a preview. Yeah, here's what's coming down the pike. How do I get a job after a failed startup? I'm having a very hard time recovering mentally because I was committed to seeing my startup through and now feel like I'm being pulled away. I feel very sad and confused. Hey, that's a great question and one that I'm really excited to answer. I think the, uh, I think the answer is full of optimism and excitement. So I look forward to it. Well, this has been Office Hours with Isaac and TK. We will see you next time. You're like Jim Henson. You have like seven different personalities you bring with these voices. (laughs) Take it easy. Peace.